Wow, I absolutely cannot believe it. It's only been one hour since I wrote the pitch and Business Insider has already gotten back to me. So in this video, you are about to learn how to write a pitch that Business Insider actually pays attention to and notices and gets back to you with some positive feedback, which was so exciting. All right, I can't wait. Let's, let's just jump right into the video. I can't wait to show you everything that Stephanie from Clap Monster taught me. Before we get into today's amazing and exciting video, I am so excited to share with you a word from our sponsors. This video is sponsored by Moo Send. Moo like the cow, send like you send a letter. Moo Send is a powerful email marketing automation software with world-class features, state-of-the-art automation flows. It's gonna help you grow your business from day one. So what does this mean? This means that you are going to be able to send emails to your email list. That's people who have signed up to hear from you about your awesome and exciting business. You're gonna be able to send gorgeous emails. You're gonna be able to automate tons of stuff. You're not sure where to get started? I wasn't either when I started with my email marketing system, but luckily Moo Send has a ton of pre-baked automation features you can just plug in and play and just go ahead and get started and personally I found their pricing very reasonable so go ahead and check them out thanks so much for watching click on the link in the video description if you want to learn more and now let's jump into the video hey everyone thanks for tuning into this video I am so excited to present today's guest <clears throat> Stephanie Stephanie is the founder of clout monster which is a media company where she helps people contact the the publications and get pitches accepted and I have asked her to help me with pitches if you watch any of my videos you know that they are not one of my strengths whereas it's basically everything Stephanie does and she's a, she's the real expert here um Stephanie take a few minutes and introduce yourself to us hi thanks for having me Zuli I'm so excited to work with you on um your idea your pitch um so a little bit about myself I have been doing publications or I've been in the media as an editor, a freelance journalist for the last, you know, almost over a decade, um, was published in the New York Times, um, GQ, Lifehacker, and I, you know, basically cut my teeth in the industry and just, and I noticed uh, people would ask me like, how did you get published? How did you get your writing on so-and-so publication? And I decided, you know, there are a lot of people uh, struggle with this and there's like a lot of kind of kind of a black box to people how the media works. Oh yeah. So decided to just uh, help people figure that out, and I've done media work and strategy for an entrepreneur named uh, Ramit Sethi, uh, author of "I Will Teach You to Be Rich," um, and helped launch his book to the New York Times bestseller uh, wow. back in 2019. So, yeah, here we are. I'm happy to dive in and. So Stephanie, you are definitely the expert here. Tell me a little bit about the benefits of going to all this effort, crafting this fantastic pitch, and ultimately getting these stories accepted in publications as big as Business Insider or even something niche or smaller. Yeah, well, I think the first thing is street cred. <laughs> like, it's it's such a huge boost to first of all your tool belt, mm -hmm. uh, your skill set, but most of all your credibility. Uh, an authority as a writer. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in my experience and uh, with my students' experiences, the more they can get published, they're basically proving to other people, including their own clients, their own students, that they, their stories, um, and they have the ability to, to be um, published on these other outlets. So that's sort of like validation no, not validation, credibility for their work. Mm -hmm. And so that just boosts um, in a world where there are so many writers, so many um, people clamoring to do the same thing, getting published in as many outlets as you can and in certain outlets like Business Insider, just lets you stand out from the crowd. Let's use rise factor, above for sure. the noise, exactly. And as a result, if you leverage, if you leverage them correctly, you get to charge clients more because they see the value in, wow, if this writer can get published in XYZ publication, then I really want to work with this person. Yeah, I can definitely see the value of that. All right, let's jump into actually coming up with a good idea for a pitch. Yeah, so originally 
for the viewers at home watching this, the original plan was actually for me to come up with my own idea, draft the pitch, and Stephanie was basically going to tear it to shreds, which was ideal. It was great. I was going <laughs> to submit myself to that in the pursuit of having a better pitch and teaching you how it's done or, you know, using myself as a terrible example. But then I got stuck. I spent, I don't know how many hours, like looking for calls for submissions and trying to come up with an idea that I thought stood a good chance. And I found that's that's actually where I was getting stuck. And so I thought it might be really helpful if instead of we get to the pitch drafting part, we start with the basics. How do you come up with an idea that you think is worthy of pitching to a publication? And yeah, let's start there. So I'll, I'll leave it to the experts. Stephanie, how do we get started with that? Zuli, that's actually coming up with the idea is obviously the first part of the whole process, right? Without the idea, you have no idea where to even place it in the media or mm. who to even contact. So I, like, it's actually a very, very common stumbling block for a lot of people when they're first thinking about, oh, I wanna get featured in the media. And then they think like, oh my gosh, I have no stories to tell. I have no idea where to even start with ideas. Um, can you tell me a little bit about where you got stuck? Like, I know it could be a spiral a little bit. Like, where did you start finding yourself kind of like hitting a wall. Yeah, absolutely. So I was on Twitter. That's where I thought would make the most sense to start looking for, for submissions. Cause my thought was, okay, I'll see which places are actively soliciting submissions. And then I'll see if I've got anything in my experience or, or life that could fit one of those. So I was looking at places like narratively, they do a lot of like personal essay style, life story type stuff. And I was like, okay, yeah, I could, I could talk about, I've had some pretty interesting stuff happen in my life. Surely I've got something I could share there. But then I was looking at their list of like stories that they'd accepted under those pitch styles before. And they were all really out there, really, really wild stuff. And I'm like, okay, maybe my life isn't that extraordinary. Like I can't compete. And then I thought, okay, well, what about places where I'm an expert? I know all about the creator economy. So I Googled what publications talk about the creator economy. And the ones that came up were like, Business Insider and Forbes. And I was like, oh, gee, I don't even know. I wouldn't even know how to start getting into Business Insider or Forbes. I did have a look. I was like, okay, maybe, maybe I can try. What's the worst that can happen? I can fail. That's it. Um, but then again, I was looking at the pitches that they accept and they're all so expert driven. I felt like I didn't really have a unique angle or opinion to offer that hadn't already been done or couldn't be done by someone better. So that's where I was getting stuck. Too boring, gotcha. life, not enough expertise. <laughs> gotcha. So the first, the first thing is uh, I would challenge you on your assumption that you aren't an expert. Clearly you are an expert in your specific niche and field. Um, you know, I always tell people, no matter who they are, I say, if you know 2% more than the other person on any kind of specific topic and they could use that help, you are an expert and you, are ex you have enough expertise to provide that insight. And really that's the goal for a lot of these media stories. It's just, first of all, telling a story, right? And then the second thing is really providing some sort of insight or lesson um, that someone can take away and just maybe that'll change their life, that pers that, their perspective, whatever it may be. And the other, the other uh, thing you mentioned too was the already been done there, you know, with the internet, so many ideas and topics and stories have already been done in some way, right? Mm -hmm. You walk into a bookstore um, and you just want to pick up a personal finance book or something. And you like walk into the aisle and there's like hundreds of personal finance books. So obviously that topic has been done before, mm -hmm. but, the, but the key here is that every one of those books, every one of these articles that you read offers that unique perspective from that person. I gotta um, say, Stephanie, it's so funny, like hearing your advice. I mean, it's, it's so true. And part of the reason mm -hmm. I know it's true is because on the other side of things, when I'm trying to help people get their start writing, they have the, I'm, I didn't realize it until I started hearing you like give me this advice, but I was like, oh my God, yeah. All these people who come to me who are too afraid to start writing, they're like, oh, I have nothing unique to contribute. Oh, I don't have enough expertise. And I tell them the exact same thing that you're telling me now. Like you yeah. have a story worth telling, you know more than other people in certain areas. And yes, every story has been done before, but that doesn't mean that you don't have a right to tell it with your own unique spin. So it's, exactly. it's really ringing true. <laughs> That's like the first part for anyone trying to come 
up with an idea is really battering through those limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. Then the second part to starting to like think about what ideas really match in the media, like what ideas of yours match in the media. I actually have a framework that I um, like to teach and it's, it's, it's very simple. I call it pitch like a pro framework. So the pro part is actually an acronym. <laughs> so pro, each of those letters stand for something. And these are these sorts of ideas that always fit in the media. So pro, P starts for popular. The media loves things that are popular. Mm -hmm. Anyone who runs a publication, any editor, any journalist, any person just associated with media, media and even like as a um, writer, and um, being on YouTube, you want to do topics that are popular, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And in the media, there are certain perennial topics that are always popular. And you can kind of suss those out by seeing obviously what's being talked about right now. But there are some perennial topics like productivity, always popular. Um, uh, let's see here, morning routines, certain workouts and how you got into shape or um, even mental health these days and what's popular obviously will change with the time. So if you basically, if you consume content in general, you already have sort of like this radar for what's popular and you kind of have a good sense of it. Mm -hmm. So that's the first um, criteria for just an idea in the media. The second part R is relevant. What's relevant to the media right now? This is usually something that's newsworthy. And if you can tie your story to something or your story idea to something that's happening in the, new, in the news cycle right now, that has a very high chance of getting accepted. Mm -hmm. So an example would be when I was working with Ramit Sethi, uh, the stock market crashed back in 2018. Obviously the stock market's not doing so well right now. So that's old news. But back then in 2018, at the height of the stock market, um, it, there was like a really drastic dip and everyone was in panic mode. Mm -hmm. And so Ramit sent this, uh, slacked me a message of his portfolio and he lost $75,000. And then I was like, holy crap. I mean, how do you feel? He's like, uh, you know, it was just kind of like, like, it was just like, I asked him what he ate for breakfast, you know? <laughs> so he was like nonchalant about it, but I'm like, Ramit, this is a story. Like everyone else is panicking in the stock market. You are, you lost $75,000. Um, you should write about the story, how you're not worried about it because mm -hmm. he is confident in his investments and just personal finance in general. Right. So that was, that's an example that got published in Buzz Business Insider and then Washington Post picked that up. Uh, and then, so the final thing, and I think the, the O, which is more relevant to you at this, um, in, in, at least in this conversation, is originality. So we talked about how not all stories are, uh, not all stories need to be so original. You don't have to reinvent the entire wheel, but you do have to add a sort of original, unique element to your story mm -hmm. for it to be published, right? And that publications don't want the exact same story, the exact same angle. So one of the fastest ways and easiest ways to make a, a, a story original is just to make it your own, like draw it from your own personal experiences uh, and be very specific about it. So we can kind of workshop that right now. Um, talk about, let's, let's say you're aiming for business insider. Yeah, sure. Shoot for yeah. the stars. Yeah. Um, one of the quick frameworks that I, tr uh, that, I, that I try to use with clients is, so think of a challenging time in your life. So there's something that comes to mind. Um, I don't talk about this a lot because I was kind of ashamed of it. I got fired during the pandemic. Uh, it must have been like October of 2020. Um, from what I thought was my dream job. And mm. I'd been working there for a year. And I really thought that this was like, it was everything I wanted. It was such a progressive tech company. The benefits were incredible. My coworkers were all amazing, but I got fired. So, I mean, that's one angle. Like I got fired from my dream job during the pandemic. This is how I turned it around. That, well, I appreciate the vulnerability 
Um, like that is always really hard to kind of admit and let that out into the world. But that is exactly one um, angle. Um, one thing I would push you on is when you, when after, after that dream job, um, how long did it, how long was it between that period and you starting your freelance? It was, to be honest, and this is kind of why I haven't done it. it there wasn't really a transition period. I had already built up my business to a, to a significant portion at that point, just went full in on my, on my freelance writing. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you a few, a few more questions because what I'm doing right here is like finding those angles and yeah. finding like that really juicy, like bang to, to add to the, to either the mock headline, mm -hmm. which is one way I come up with ideas is really just think about what would the headline look like uh, if I were to pitch this story and if they were to publish this story. Mm -hmm. So you had gone fired from your dream job in 2020. Uh, and you, it sounds like you had already been working on your freelance business. Yeah. So I'd been writing for a little over two years at that point, nothing super serious, but I had one or two freelance clients. I had my medium income. How did you, at what point did you start to take your freelance more seriously? It was at that point. It was when I, when I got fired and I realized I'd been pushed mm. <laughs> into what I should really be doing. Okay. So one angle from that is basically like, what I thought was my dream job and getting fired turned out to be a blessing because like a blessing in disguise, because now I have this six figure freelance writing business, six figures. Um, and that's how, how much, what's the um, income difference between your dream job and your freelance? I'm actually business? making twice as much as I was in my, what I thought was my dream job, which was fantastic. So that's another detail you want to include. So we're going to work that into the headline or like basically the lead. Mm -hmm. So what are some like three lessons you've learned from this transition period? Like now that you've gone all in. I think the first lesson is that sometimes imposter syndrome is real. And sometimes it's, it's telling you that you're an imposter and maybe you should get out. I know there's so much stuff, especially around women who, you know, they think that, you know, they have imposter syndrome and really they're so good at their job. I had imposter syndrome like almost the entire time I was what I thought was imposter syndrome almost the entire time I was working there and I felt like I was always having to like conceal how poorly I was doing and I managed to kind of talk myself around like oh it's all in your head Zuli like you're actually a lot better than you think you are and then I had my performance review and my boss was like yeah no you're pretty bad <laughs> I was like oh no <laughs> I knew it all along I really did suck <laughs> Um, so that's one thing I wish I'd known because I spent so much mental energy, like trying to convince myself that I was good at this job when really I wasn't. So that's number mm. one. I think number two is that, I don't know if this is going to be a, a good angle, but this is something I was really, really cognizant of was I was, I had the luxury of making that decision because I had such a thick safety net. Like I already had income lined up. I was living at home with my parents. I was under 26. So I had health insurance covered under my parents' job. Like not everyone has the luxury to make that the decision that I made. And it's easy to say, oh, I was, I was brave, but there were some things that were a lot easier for me than they would have been for other people in a, in a different situation. So I wish, I wish like startup culture talked a little bit more about the fact that a lot of people in these really good positions, we, we just had better circumstances in some cases. And right. I think the third thing is, so the, the job I was in was kind of like a sales job and I was really bad at sales. Now I, I'm awesome at sales. It's my whole job. I have to sell stuff. I have to sell articles. I have to sell headlines. I have to sell products to my audience. And I'm really good at it because I love what I do. And I really believe in what I'm selling. And I think that's something I wish I'd learned earlier. It's if you believe in what you're selling, if you believe in yourself, if you believe in your mission, these, these skills that you think are beyond you are actually within your reach as long as you're like personally and deeply connected to them. Three, so it's like three lessons about success from building a six figure business after getting fired from my dream job. So I think you can massage that a little bit. There's something there. So success, six figure business, fired from my dream job. Those are the three factors we want in the title. Those are the three factors because those give you a unique, like a unique angle to it. From what you've been saying, I've picked up on a few things that you've said that really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. First of all, 
this, these, we all have these self-limiting beliefs when it comes to writing. And apparently when it comes to pitching too, <laughs> where you think that you don't know enough to be an expert, to share your opinion. And you think that you don't have anything original con to contribute. And neither of those things is, is really true. You do, as long as you know, 2% more than the person who's reading it, then you are an expert and you have something to offer. And in terms of uniqueness, yes, everything has been done before, but never by you. And that's where the originality comes in. I also really liked your point about staying true to yourself as much as you can, um, especially if it's like you have to share some vulnerability. You never know the other person who might read it on the other end of the line and they'll feel seen. And that's an incredible feeling. Absolutely. And I really liked your framework. I love a good framework and popular, relevant and original. That's a winning formula for me, I think. And I, I can definitely see the power of that in, in pitches. So that has helped us come up with two ideas in the span of Zoom tells me we've been recording for a little over 30 minutes, which is great. So that's that's fantastic. OK, so Stephanie, thank you again. That was such a valuable lesson that you taught me here. And again, one of my many uh, vulnerabilities is that I'm not very good at pitching. I've, I've, I've always been afraid to. And I feel like I've got more tools and a little bit more knowledge to at least try. And that's how you get better, right? You try and you try and you try. And sometimes you succeed. So thank you again so much for sharing all this incredible wisdom. Before I let you go, Tell me, how can people find you if they want to hear more of your incredible insights? Yeah, uh, it was really great talking to you, Zuli. Um, if people are interested in more pitching tips, just media insights, uh, learning headlines, and anything to do with media and media strategy, uh, they can find me at clapmonster.com. I have a mm -hmm. newsletter that I send every week, um, every Tuesday, that breaks down tips, headlines, whatever I find interesting in the media, I make sure that there's some really valuable uh, tips and nuggets in every newsletter. So check it out. I'll share the link with you, Zuli. I know. Yeah, I know. I'll be signing up for sure. I can't <laughs> wait to get my first, uh, my first email next Tuesday. All right. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions, please pop them below in the comment box. I answer every single one. And if you stump me, I'll reach out to Stephanie to see if I can get her take. And I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye, everyone. Thank you for watching. So I the, the piece that I wrote ultimately didn't end up going anywhere with Business Insider, but I still got that positive reply and I still pitched Business Insider, which was something I never thought I could do. I will definitely take what I've learned from these methods and apply them to future big publications. And I hope that you have just as much success, if not more, as I did. Thank you so much for watching.